right, you guys, so what we're gonna be looking at today is one of my favorite movies to start off the class. We're not gonna be watching the whole thing, we're gonna look at a short little clip. A reason why I love this movie so much is because it's got awesome special effects. Raise your hand if you like special effects. I know a lot of us do. Raise your hand, keep it up, if you've ever seen the movie Avatar. Okay, I love this one. It's got awesome special effects. It's, I think, by James Cameron, and it was really popular, really, really well known because of the special effects. We're gonna be looking at this and thinking about how the special effects really help us understand what's going on, help us visualize and get the movie. Then we're gonna be applying it to our reading, okay? You're probably like, how are we gonna apply Avatar to our reading? But you will see in a second. I see the benefits of gradual release as the framework for instruction. Um, that students really have an opportunity to gain an understanding of the concept that's being taught. It prevents me from having to constantly go back and reteach. By providing that framework, I know exactly what to expect. My students know what to expect. And that progression is just, it, it makes sense for students and their learning. I felt like I was there. Raise your hand if you felt like you were there. The special effects definitely help. The main reason I love this movie so much is because it's so visual. You feel like you're there, you're experiencing it. You guys know I love books as well. I like books where I feel like I'm there, like I can visualize what's happening. Raise your hand if you like those kinds of books. So what we're gonna be doing today is looking at Mr. Tuckett, the figurative language that we see in that book, and how that makes us feel like we can visualize, picture what's going on. Who'd like to read our I can statement, our objective for today's lesson? Patrick, go ahead. Wow. So that's what we're gonna be doing. We've gotten really good at identifying figurative language and explaining some things about it. But what we're looking at in particular today is how the figurative language helps us see what's going on in the text. So the gradual release today was basically taking the figurative language that we've been working with all year a step further. So we've been identifying and explaining figurative language all year and my kids have progressively gotten better at identifying it, but I really wanted for them to take it a step further with seeing how the figurative language helps us as we're reading. And what I'm gonna be doing today is I'm gonna be reading out loud just a little ways through the book. And when I'm done reading, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna think about the types of figurative language that I hear. And these are the two that we're looking at in particular, similes and metaphors. We're really familiar with these. We know that these are the two types of figurative language that compare things, okay? Only difference is the simile compares using, using like or as, whereas metaphor doesn't use like or as. We're comparing by saying one thing is the other. Now, the thing I love about this book is Gary Paulson, the author, does a really good job of comparing things so that I feel like I can taste it, so I feel like I can see it. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today, okay? So go ahead and follow along with me on page 23. I'm just gonna be reading a short section here until he looked at Mr. Grimes' face. It was a thin face and almost as dark as an Indian's, except that it bore a bushy beard and mustache. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there because I saw two types of figurative language there. And those two examples of figurative language helped me really see what it is Gary Paulson, the author, was telling me. Okay, so he told me, but I could see it, I could visualize it. <clears throat> so the first one, and you guys can look on your student sheet, um, or you can look up here on the projector. The first one was when Francis compares the way Mr. Grimes' body was as he rides into the camp. He compared it to a piece of timber. So I know that I've seen my husband and my dad growing up build things with timber, right? Just those pieces of wood, and it's really straight, really rigid. So I picture him being really rigid when he comes in. I can really visualize that. He then uses a simile to compare Mr. Grimes' face, saying it's almost as dark as an Indian's. So that just gives me an idea of what Mr. Grimes looks like, what his skin looks like. And I'm kind of picturing, well, if it's not as dark as an Indian's, that just makes me think maybe he's outside a lot. He gets a lot of sun. So it really helps me see what he looks like. We are now going to look at another example. Today we saw the... I do portion where I was reading from the text and then modeled identifying the figurative language and then what that helped us visualize. It was like a stepping stone from the I do to the we do. Why I'm already liking this chapter. I feel like I can smell the coffee. Francis awakened to a heavenly smell 
the aroma of boiling coffee. Yum. We're going to read this. I'll read it out loud. As I'm reading, you guys are going to be listening really carefully to see if you hear any figurative language. What's going to be difficult is you're not going to say anything. Because whenever I stop reading, you guys are going to turn to your high five partners, look at them. Christian, you'll be with um, Patrick and Ariana. Uh, <laughs> Antonio, you can be with the two over there. Um, and with your high five partner, you're going to say, what type of figurative language was it? And then you're going to say, what does that help me visualize? What does that make me think of the way Gary Paulson compares two things here? Okay, so I'm going to read out loud. You guys are going to be listening carefully. When I'm done reading, you're going to get going with your high five partner. And I'll remind you once I'm done reading. I read aloud but had them identify the figurative language and discuss. Francis awakened to a heavenly smell, the aroma of boiling coffee. I'm going to stop there. I saw a couple of you kind of be like perk up. I feel like you heard the figurative language. What you guys are going to do in just a second, you're going to give your high five partner a high five. You're going to say where the figurative language was, what type, so you're going to identify it just like I did here. Was it a metaphor? Was it a simile? And then what does the author mean by that? I allowed students to work with their partners in their collaborative group to read and identify and explain the figurative language. Then we brought it back as the whole group so that we were building off of one another, learning from each other. Like or as? Fancy city man. It says like, so it's a simile. And Ms. Grimes Did you guys find it? is already up and Francis just woke up. So he's he's comparing him to a city man because they sleep. Okay. But remember we're looking for metaphors and similes. Oh. So did you guys find a metaphor or a similar? I found, there? I found a similar. Okay. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and share out. We're going to practice some accountable talk. And we all know that with accountable talk, we do a really good job of listening respectfully to one another. We don't raise our hands. We listen respectfully. How do we know that someone's listening respectfully to us? How do we know that? Antonio? person has eyes on you and they're and nobody else is talking and exactly so when Antonio was just talking to me was I looking over there no I was looking at him so I know someone's listening when they're looking at me and then when do we know it's time for us to speak so when someone stops when do we know okay it's okay for me to now talk Conrad when there's silence and no one's talking. yeah when there's that silence now what happens if we all get kind of eager and we all start talking at once what happens then? Haley? We just back off and let someone else go. Yeah, back off and let someone else go. Good. What type of figurative language are we seeing? Okay, where is it in there? So what's the quote? And then what does that type of figurative language mean? What does the author mean by that? Who would like to start us off with our accountable talk? Remember, we are going to speak up as well. Damien, go ahead and get started. Um, it's a simile when you sleep like a fancy city man. The way I got accountable talk set up in my classroom, where I just step back, kids don't raise hands, kids respond to one another. I didn't necessarily know that it would work. Well, it's been something I've been working on every year with every single one of my classes, and it's worked every year with every single one of my classes. A fourth of my class are ESE students this year, and they also participate in the accountable talk. I started off really small. We set the ground rules, and the students don't raise their hands, they wait for the silence. If there's two students talking at once, one has to back off. And I really just tried to apply it to real life and make them see how this does apply. When you grow up, we don't raise hands, we talk to one another. And I think the students like the fact that they're gaining life skills that they're gonna be able to use in the workforce. What we're gonna do, let's go ahead and get this jotted down in, our, in the guided practice section of our journal. Okay, so we're going to say what type of figurative language it was and then what we just discussed, what that type of figurative language meant, what Gary Paulson meant by that. Okay, so as you guys are finishing up, let me tell you where, what you're going to be doing next. We're going to take about 10 minutes. You guys, with your same high five partners, are going to read into chapter six. Okay. 
So from where we left off, you guys are going to continue reading. There's a few more examples of figurative language, and they're really good examples, okay? They really help you visualize what Gary Paulson, the author, is trying to get you to see as you're reading. So you with your partner are going to continue reading through page 34, at least to page 36, okay? And what you guys are going to do is just what we just did there. You're going to read looking for figurative language. You will identify the figurative language just as we did just then. And then you're going to explain why the author used that. What does that help you see or visualize? The length of the gradual release lesson really depends on what's being taught and where the students are with the concept. For instance, if it's, if it's a new standard that students haven't been exposed to yet, it might take a little bit longer in the I do and we do section. Therefore, the whole gradual release will be taking a little bit longer. But if it's a standard that we've gone over previously uh, in the year and students already have a basic understanding, not necessarily as long. Just based off of the students' learning is really what determines how long the lesson's going to take. Francis stretched quick. Winching at the pain in his legs, that would be from the little mare. The pain in, the, in his arm would be from falling on them, and the pain in his knees from the rocks he had landed on. But the During my checks for understanding, I would say a portion of the class did as I expected. Um, a lot of them were having really good conversation about what the figurative language meant, what it helped them visualize, whereas some of my students were just identifying the language and not necessarily taking it a step further and saying what that helped them visualize what the figurative language meant. So based off of that, that's something that I hit on when I pull my strategy groups. So a lot of my ESC students, some of the other ones that didn't necessarily take it that step further, that's where we're going to be addressing. RP. Good, so let's stop there for a second. So I see you guys have gotten to page 36, but we haven't gotten any figurative language yet. Have we not found any? I found um, one. When you quit um, stucking when, like, an old buffalo. Okay. I saw it. Yeah, it was on page 34. So what type of figurative language is that? Um, it was simile. A simile, okay. And what do you think he meant by that, when you quit sucking wind like an old buffalo? Um, breathing hard. Breathing really hard? Yeah, I think we should do... The jerky was as tough as an old boo because it's a simile because it says the jerky was as tough as an old boot. And they're or, comparing, or it could be um, probably a metaphor. And why it's a simile or a metaphor, mainly a simile because it's comparing the jerky to an old boot, how tough it is to an old boot. I know how to model based off of the students. So it's not my intention to stand up and go on and on for students and cons consistently be talking and them listening to me because when that happens, they just shut down. So my model generally isn't too long, um, but I know when it's time to release based off of checks for understanding, whether it's a turn and talk with a neighbor, uh, where they're talking as a whole class and getting to respond to one another, or just going around and listening to each other. So just for us to wrap up everything that we were talking about today, we've gotten really good at identifying figurative language and explaining some things about it. Okay, so today is Thursday. Let's all turn our attention to our schedules for Thursday. Okay, guys. My rotations are based off of data from CGAs, iReady, classroom assessments. So it's not just from one source or one piece. I pulled that group because of something that we did in class. We did a Padea seminar last week, and it went wonderfully because my students are used to accountable talk. Um, but these students didn't chime in as much as I would have liked, so that's why I pulled it back in into a small group. The graffiti wall, it's help, helpful for some of the kinesthetic learners, just getting to move, but 
This way I'm getting to see some of their responses, some of their ideas as they're reading um, and getting them to interact with the text as they're reading as well. They also have a read to self log where they log down the answers to some questions, some guiding questions. Make a puzzle, eight puzzles, map each type of figurative language with its definition and an example from the story. Write your answers on the recording log, which is this. So you would use these and you would put them in the parts that go like this would probably be the example. And you have to match them up and copy the things down. And then you have to highlight the figurative language things, which is here, what the like um, the metaphor, simile, personification, hyperbole, alliteration, and you'd find these and highlight them and write them down. I'll see some students that are below grade level in just about every standard but one. And the fixer and the teacher in me wants to address all of those, but I know that I can't at once. So what I do is a little bit at a time. We choose two standards a week that we focus on. That way, the students that need more work in that during their strategy work, they get more work. I pull the strategy groups to go over, reinforce those standards, those strategies. And my whole goal is to make it so their work is meaningful by having them just answer three questions really quickly, you know, based off of what they did by writing on the graffiti wall, by doing those sorts of things, I'm checking to see if they're getting it. Therefore, they know that I'm checking that they're doing it, so they know it's meaningful. They know that what they're doing has a purpose. My process of organizing and keeping up with all the papers has been a lengthy one. It didn't happen overnight. So what I found was something that worked for me and for my students. I give them a schedule that they know that they are going to follow. Uh, they have that schedule, it changes per week, but the schedule is based off of CGA data. Well, for me, gradual release at first was a little bit new, um, but from the beginning of the year, I feel like I've gotten so much more comfortable with it and my students have. And the thing about implementing it is, if you get into the framework, if you get into the routine of the I do, we do, they do, you do, not only is it easier for me, it's easier for the students. They know what to expect. They know that I'm going to be showing them first and then we're going to be doing it and then they're going to get a chance. And I just feel like we all know that students are really into routines. Kids are routined. Um, and then for, so for them to have that framework and to constantly be going by that, it's just really helpful and I've seen it really help my students this year.